A-level geology, natural resources, video three. The formation of metalliferous ores from sedimentary processes. So this is the third in the series of videos. This one concentrate about the sedimentary processes that form metal ores. There are four processes that we'll look at. What I'll say from the start is there are very good sections in the textbook uh, the, about precipitated deposits, place deposits and evaporated deposits. So make sure you read through them for more detail. Now residual deposits are responsible for the formation of bauxite, which is the ore for aluminium. Precipitated deposits normally refer to questions on copper and banded iron formations. Placer deposits normally refer to gold and uranium and sometimes cassiterite, which is tin. And evaporated deposits always refer to rock salts such as halite. Now there's an important distinction between two processes which often get students confused. The two processes are residual deposits and precipitated deposits. I'll go through in more detail about a couple of the slides in a minute, but it's important to appreciate the distinction. Both processes involved somehow an enrichment of uh, a soil or a rock somehow, but they're subtly different. Residual deposits, as the name suggests, is where weathering processes wash out uh, minerals, but leave um, for in bauxite, for instance, aluminium behind. Whereas secondary enrichment is where there's an initial um, copper uh, rock with not a, a great high percentage, but leaching processes take the copper out and deposit it, precipitate it elsewhere in greater volumes and greater uh, grade value. Okay, so let's have a look at residual deposits. Those are left behind. On the right, you'll see a typical soil called a laterite, where uh, bauxite is mined from the top few layers. And remember, this is for aluminium. So bauxite is created by the very heavy weathering in hot uh, tropical climates of suitable rocks, i.e. those that have a degree of aluminium in the first place. So what happens is we have heavy, intense rainfall, which washes out a lot of the soluble minerals down to lower layers. So what we see in this example is where the soil itself, where calcium and potassium, which are more soluble salts, have been washed down by the action of weathering and uh, the flow of water, leaving behind an aluminium-rich soil layer, which is bauxite. Okay. Similar, but this time it's a secondary enrichment process, is the formation of copper deposits. Now what we have is an initial rock, this whole area here, this might be a whole seam of copper, copper-rich um, mineral vein. But it's not of a high enough grade to be profitable. Now what happens in a lot of countries, especially where chemical weathering is high, we get the process where rainfall leaches out the copper and then it goes down to the water table where it is precipitated. Now, as I said, this is not a copper forming process, it's an enrichment process where the copper that's already in the rock is um, given a sort of greater density lower down or somewhere else. Okay, so let's have a look at what happens. There's our rainfall. So that moves down through the rock through that seam down to the water table, as we can see here. So there's the water table, there's the zone of permanent saturation. So the water has sort of moved down into this zone. Now, the copper will be taken down with it. As soon as it gets to this permanently uh, waterlogged zone, the copper will come out of solution and precipitate itself around this zone here. It becomes very rich in copper just around the water table mark. Now this process is called oxidization where the copper is removed. Here's a typical question about secondary enrichment. What we have here is a top surface exposed to the atmosphere. And here's water flowing down to the permanently saturated area 
the water table. You can see the copper is being washed down from the top area down to this water table here. And in this zone, it precipitates out. This is the reduction zone. And this is the oxidizing zone above it here. How do we know this? Well, look at the diagram to the right. Here we see is the average copper in this area. And this is a decreasing copper, and this is an increasing copper. The top surface there has less copper, so that shows it's been washed out, it's been leached out. Whereas here, which is equivalent to this zone here, you can see that in fact there's a high degree of enrichment of copper, so therefore that must be the water table zone. The other type of sedimentary process uh, forms banded iron deposits. These aren't formed anymore, but these form under very special circumstances, estimates between 2.5 and 1.8 billion years ago. And this is the, due to the change in atmospheric oxygen. Now, due to the rise of um, photosynthesis, um, microorganisms, and also some, some um, more advanced uh, sea plants and perhaps even some land plants, we'll see that uh, oxygen was uh, more oxygen was pumped up into the atmosphere. Now, this oxygen itself caused greater weathering and erosion of the the land surface, and so therefore more iron was washed out into the sea. So deposits of this time show a very iron-rich sedimentary layers, well, uh, not one layer, but a couple of layers, and they repeat all around the world. And because they are in bands of magnetite and jasper, iron-rich, we call them the banded iron deposits, the BIFs. Now, placer deposits are another type of sedimentary association. Again, it's not a question of forming ore deposits, it's a question of concentrating uh, deposits for, some, for things like uranium, uh, tin, and more famously, gold. So, in this diagram, you can see there's the original ore vein. They would obviously wouldn't be as exposed as this because you're pretty dull because you can probably just go and get the gold, tin, whatever to start with. But what happens is the rocks get uh, broken up by weathering and then the individual nuggets um, get washed away with the river. Now, because they have certain uh, characteristics, certain qualities, these placer deposits, um, a variety of things can happen to them. So here's some particular locations where placer deposits might form. Now numbers one to four are what we call sediment traps. It's a very common question, possibly an extension question in the G4 exam talking about the possible locations for uh, place deposits. So make sure you go through the textbook to go through these in more detail. So what are the particular characteristics of uh, uranite, which is UO2 here, to make it suitable as a place deposit? Well, first of all, uranium uranite is hard. Okay, anything greater than five is more resistant to abrasion and attrition. So it's not going to get broken down by river processes. As we know from the Felspar quartz analysis, the lack of cleavage, especially in uranite, uh, means that it's resistant to physical disintegration. It doesn't get broken up, broken up along its fracture lines. Very importantly is its density. If it's greater than 4.5, it means it's quite heavy. So the heavier the mineral, then the less likely it is to be moved by river water. So it concentrates in certain zones. Uranite, we've got a very high density, it's a very heavy rock. So that means it doesn't get washed away and it tends to concentrate in certain zones where other lighter minerals get washed away. And obviously very importantly, if it's been transported by rivers, it's insoluble or resistant to chemical weathering. So a very good place deposit would have perhaps three or four of these qualities. The last type of sedimentary deposits are evaporite deposits. These form in hot, dry climates and are often associated with um, inland lagoons, that's lakes just by the sea. 
Uh, in this instance, we'll talk about something called a player lake. Now, what we have here is you can see there's the open sea, and we often have a sandbar blocking the open sea from the inland lake here. What happens is we get this uh, the sea often in, in high winds and in typical sort of high tide conditions uh, will spill over the bar and replenish the lake. But after that, the lake is pretty much cut off from the open sea. As it's salt water, what will happen, there's a high amounts of evaporation. And so as evaporation can only be pure water, the salt left is left behind as a evaporite deposit. So these are some of the things we just talked about. So there's the uh, lagoon itself, the player lake. It's only sometimes very shallow. As you said before, you get these evaporite deposits and there's many cycles of replenishment, evaporation and subsidence. Believe it or not, these layers get so thick, the whole area here subsides under the weight of evaporites. And so if this subsides, it allows more water in on top and so there's extra layers deposited above the original uh, salt layer. So just three meters of seawater produces five centimeters of evaporite rock. Here's a past paper question about evaporites. Take a bit of time to look through it. Okay, what information have we got here? Well, here's the bar. You can see there's the bar and possibly the sea will be on this side of that particular bar. And here's this depression here, which would form the inland lagoon, the player lake. So remember, seawater washes over the top at particular times of year, especially in high tides or strong winds. And so it replenishes seawater. Now, salts, very much like Bowen's reaction series, have different orders of solubility. So some salts, for instance, potassium and magnesium salts, are much more soluble than calcite. So when we're looking at a player lake and we're looking at one um, body of water in there that gets evaporated, calcite would be the first to be evaporated because it evaporates when there's a percentage of seawater is only 50 to 60 percent water. After that, there'll be a layer of gypsum above it. After that, there'll be a layer of halite. And after that, there'll be the potassium and magnesium salts. So we get this particular zoning of salts within the precipitates. This is the plan view, the view from above of that same circular lake. So the questions. Question one, describe the shape and structure of the rapite deposit. Well, that would be an oval. Don't forget you'd include the um, dimensions of the lake as well. So you'd use the scale to calculate the width and the, um, so the length and the width of that particular lake. So state which one of the four evaporite minerals is least soluble. Well, it'd have to be calcite as that's the one that's precipitated out first. Finally, in sedimentary processes, sometimes there are diagrams that want to link all three together. So it might give you a cross section of a bit of continental crust and ask you to identify what type of sedimentary deposits happen where. So we could say here we see some heavy weathering of rock that would produce um, a leached bauxite deposit. Here, as the river flows over the land and we get gravels, there'd be some sort of placer deposit, gold, diamonds or tin. And here we get precipitates in the sea and that could form our banded um, iron formation.